Um, they, they asked us to fill in this nice bio that someone was actually going to read out so you knew who I was, but uh, we seem to be missing someone to do that. Uh, so my name is Graham Longton. Uh, if you don't know of me, I'm the author of Mod Whiskey and also another package called Wrap, which is a, a package for decorators, uh, which is sort of where actually this talk is coming from. Uh, this actually wasn't the original talk I was going to uh, do. Uh, so hopefully you're not coming here because of the other talk. Um, and there's a bit of talk on, on decorators. Uh, now, I'm at the end of about a month and a half of trouble. This is travel. This is my fifth fifth week. I've come down with a cold in the last few days, so hopefully I won't lose my voice and I won't go into a coughing fit and we can get through all of this. <coughs> so what I want to talk about today is uh, thread synchronization in Python. So if you're doing multi-threading applications, and now who here has had the misfortune of having to deal with multi-threading in Python? <laughs> Yeah, a fair number. Uh, so the idea of multi-threading, um, one of the problems is how you control access to shared data uh, from these different threads in your application. So just to explain what a thread is if you're not familiar, uh, if you run a one application over here and you run a separate application over there, there is separate processes and they can run concurrently. Multi-threading is a way of running two activities inside of one process, so you've got two bits of code or multiple bits of code running at the same time within the same process space, the same memory space, the same data, everything. Uh, and you need to have those things potentially at times uh, communicate with, or not communicate, but work on the same data. So in Python, uh, the means of creating threads, there is a threading module, uh, which you can actually then create a thread object, uh, give it the function you want to run for that thread and, and start it up. So this particular bit of example here is, is running uh, a number of threads, it's defaulting to one, but we can run more than one, and it's just going to run some task, and they'll all run in parallel. And when, what, at the end, once we've started all those threads, the main thread is just gonna wait for all those threads to finish, and that's what the join does. So that's the basics of threading. Uh, but as I mentioned, we need to uh, work on data structures that are in that process, and that, multiple threads may need to access that. So let's have a little quick example here of a class called a counter, which has got a very simple variable in it. We're going to increment the value of that. Now I've, I've fudged that increment method in that, that class there a little bit, and I've, I've put a little sleep in there. Uh, and that's important in terms of what I want to demonstrate here. Uh, what it's done is I've, I've grabbed the value of my, that I want to actually increment, done a sleep, and then I'm going to increment. So I'm, I'm done this to show a, the update not being atomic, okay? Mm -hmm. and this was an issue when we come to threads because you're gonna have all these threads come together at the same time and here I've executed 100 threads in parallel. They all wanna increment that counter. But because there's that little delay in between getting the value and incrementing it, it means that they could, a number of them could get the same value at the same time. They all increment and they update and they're all updating it to the same values. That operation is not atomic. So we do that, and my example, I expect to get 100. I have 100 threads incrementing the value, and I only get 11. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the problem we're trying to solve, the problem of thread synchronization, uh, trolling activities of those mobile threads between uh, uh, on that, that shared value. The simple way of handling this in uh, Python uh, is to use a thread synchronization primitive like a mutex lock. So it's basically that each thread, when it comes to that bit of code where it needs to perform that operation, it will grab this lock. And that means it's got exclusive access to that lock. Everything else will be blocked from running any code which is also controlled by that same lock. And I can then safely go and increment my value there and I, I get the desired result. So these lock objects, you know, they're fairly easy to use. You can, you end up when you do uh, multi-thread programming in Python, you end up taking these locks and you start sprinkling them for all through your code. Uh, and you can use the, the with statement there, which is using that thread lock as what's called a context manager, to essentially say, I'm gonna acquire the lock at the start of this block of code, run my code, and when it drops out the bottom of that code, it's gonna release that lock for me. And some other thread can then acquire the lock and, and do it. Uh, in other languages though, although we've got this lock object in, in Python, in other languages there is actually support built into the language for doing this sort of thing. And in Java there is this keyword called synchronized. And you have the ability to just 
rather than have to create individual lock objects wherever you eat them, you can just put a synchronized keyword on the methods of a class. And what it means is that those, when those um, methods are run, it's actually going to lock the instance of the class that that method is on. Uh, and that way, if I've got a common counter class like that, it's going to do the equivalent of, with lock, run the contents of that method. So how can we bring this to Python? How can we have this, a decorator? That rather, rather than having to worry about creating the lock classes themselves, we can do something very similar to Java and just have this synchronized decorator, uh, equivalent of their keyword. So to do that, we need a decorator. Um, and if you're not familiar with decorator, it's a way of providing a wrapper around a function so that when you call that function, it's actually going to call into your wrapper first. It uh, allows you to do some work, and then you can call the original wrapped function, uh, and then return, or and possibly also on returning, do additional work as well. And the decorator, it's I said, it's only just a, it's a function wrapper. Uh, the, the at symbol there in the decorator actually is just a bit of syntactic sugar, uh, where you can you could have done this yourself by essentially just creating an instance of class, par or passing in that or creating an instance, calling that synchronized function, passing it the increment method, taking the result, reassigning the original increment. You can do it manually, but that, that at symbol on the decorator, just a bit of syntactic magic to make this a, a much nicer. So how can we make that decorator? So we're doing a decorator the normal way that you would approach it. You're using a function, and inside of that, you're going to have a nested function, uh, which actually provides the, the wrapper. And as, uh, this one's a bit more complicated than that because we've actually got a, a third uh, wrap function around that so we can pass an argument in it. Because if you're going to use a function like this, you don't have an instance of a class to really store data against. And we want a lock object. So the first approach that people often do with this if they want to try and do a, sync, a decorator for implementing synchronizer, synchronized, is that they will pass a lock into that, uh, into that uh, function which you're going to use for that decorator. And Right in the inner wrap function, a wrapper function, we're going to essentially just do with lock and call that original function. So how does that going to look like in code when we use it? So we've got a, a decorator here function, or really a factory function for creating a decorator, and we're going to have to pass a lock function. If we want to apply this to a method of a class, the only place that we can put that instance of that lock is as a class attribute. Okay? Ending, ending up code will work, but because it's a class attribute, the problem is that it means that if you have multiple instances of our counter class, and Fred's operating on them uh, independently, because that lock is shared across all instances of the class, when I lock it, I'm actually locking out code executing on all instances of that counter class. So unlike our original example where we created that lock and had it on the instance of the counter, uh, this one's shared. So the instance on the counter meant that we're only locking that one instance. Here we're locking all instances. So it's not really desirable. It gives us the correct result, but it's, it's sort of going to slow us down. If this was a, something more complicated than a counter, where it was a long running operation, uh, then you're going to lock out all the other threads from running that operation on a different instance. Okay? So let's have to do something a bit more complicated. And have I got the right slide? Yeah, I had a mistake on this and I had to fix it. Um, we want to be able to get a instance of our lock on our on the instance of the class we're going to apply this decorator to, or the method, method the instance of the class of the method we're going to apply this to. So rather than pass in uh, our lock, we've got rid of that outer function this time, and we're not passing in our lock ourselves. What we're going to do is that in the implementation of the wrapper function that we're applying around the method, we're going to make an assumption that we are applying this to an instance method. And an instance method, as you know, always get past a self-argument. So we'll have our wrapper function take as the first argument the self-argument, which would be the instance, and then take our extra arguments that, that we, it would have originally get called for. So rather than we could have implemented this so that we required the implementer of the class in the underscore init method to create the instance of the lock themselves so that it was already available. But here we're going to do try and be a bit more magic about it uh, so that we can avoid a need to do that. So we're not just be able to allow people to just 
put this synchronized decorator on a method and have it work without having to do anything else. So what we can do there is that we've got our self, our instance, so we can see if there exists an attribute on that instance for a lock already. If there isn't one there, we'll create one. Now, we've got a little bit of a problem here that we might have multiple threads come in at the same time. We don't have a lock there initially, and they both may think that lock doesn't exist. And so we need to ensure that only one of those threads is going to create that lock instance. Now, there's a bit of a, a trick you can use here in, in Python when working on dictionaries. This is a method called set default. So rather than using get, which will just get it for you, set default acts like get in that it will return the attribute in the dictionary if it exists already. If it doesn't exist already, it will actually set it with the argument you are providing. So in this case, I've created an argument threading.rlock, which I'm passing as a second argument to set default. So what will happen is that the code will come in here. If there's no lock, it'll go into the set default. Set default is an atomic operation. Only one thread will be allowed in there to that, op that operation at a time. That way I'm guaranteed that only one thread will get to set it. Now the interesting thing of being atomic means that if both of them are calling the set default at the same time and one gets blocked, one will get to set it, but both will end up getting returning the lock that the first one got to put in there. Okay? So it's a very primitive way of, of doing exclusion locking on, on threads. So this allows me then to have this decorator applied to a method. The first time it's called, my lock will get created on that instance automatically. So I can do that. No lock created anywhere. And that looks pretty good compared to um, what we had with, with uh, Java, right? So we're getting somewhere. And that also gives us the correct result. That's on a class method. Now, what if we want to stick this on a normal function? Do that, it won't work. And that is because we've made this assumption that it takes a self argument because we've made assumptions working on a class. So, and this is where the wrapped uh, package comes in that I mentioned I'm the author of. Uh, so we'll install wrapped. Now, one of the things that uh, wrapped does, or the way that wrapped works, is its own decorator function to help you to create another decorator. And so this is an example of how you would do a decorator in wrapped. You're going to define your wrapper function. It's going to take four arguments in this case. A wrapped argument, which is the original function that the decorator was applied to. An instance argument, which I'll explain soon. And my args and key w args. Interesting to note is that they are not star args and star keyword args. They're actually just straight arguments. Uh, if you're interested in that, and we can talk about that later. But um, if you compare it to how the previous and in that implementation of that wrapper, uh, I can essentially do my operation before the call, do the call the original by calling wrapped with the arguments, and then I can do an, an action on the exit. Uh, so that's the basics of how you would use it. But one of the interesting things with how wrapped works, and this is where that instance argument comes in. So you're not only pass function that the was a you are passed an instance arguments. If you apply it to a class method, when your wrapper function is called, that instance argument will be instance of the class that it was used with. If instance is none, it means that it was applied to a normal function. Uh, we also have a couple of other alternatives. Uh, if the instance, if the, the instance argument is that's passed in is a class, a type, it means it was applied to a class method. Uh, and finally, what's the other option? I can't remember. Class function. Um, yeah, so, well, anyway, there's four options. There is, if it was applied to a normal function, which can also be a, a static method, it can apply to an instance method, a class method, or actually apply to a class itself. Uh, I won't go into that class one. It's a bit weird. Uh, and so this means we can actually implement a universal decorator, a decorator that knows when it has been applied in these different contexts. Usually what you would have to do is you'd end up having to write multiple decorators that work in those different contexts. 
but here we can have one. So we can start to make use of that. So in our, our version of our, the decorator we had before, we changed now to use the wrap package for the implementation of this decorator. We can look at that instance argument. If the instance is set, so not none in this case, then the context where we're going to apply that uh, lock, or where we're going to put that lock, is going to be the actual instance. Okay. Now, just a bit word about vars. Um, vars is a function that exists in Python, built-in function, allows you to get the dict associated with an object. So if you've got an instance, it's the same as self dot underscore dict. Okay. Um, I'm using that uh, because when you talk about um, applying it to classes, uh, you have to do something a bit different. And uh, I just haven't used VARS for those one fitting around with objects. Uh, now, if instance was none, we need somewhere to put that lock. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to put the lock on the function we wrapped. Okay? Because uh, there is no instance of the class, we're going to put it on the actual function. Same mechanism as before, we see if the lock is there. Uh, if it's not there, we're going to uh, put, add one onto that instance of the class. Uh, and then we can lock it and we can do the work. Okay, everyone follow? Not lost any too many people. Um, so we can now do this. We can put synchronized on a normal function as well. Um, works on the instance method. And there's the example of the instance method. So uh, just to clarify, so you can see in the case of a normal function, you can see that the lock object was created on the function. And in the case of on an instance method, the lock has been created on the instance. Okay. Now, just to check, we'll check to see whether that lock is not on the class type, and it's not. So originally when we did this, we put on the, as a class attribute. That's not happening here. There isn't one there, so we know that, that fails on this. Um, now what about static methods in a class? Uh, a static method in a class has no argument. You're not given a self, you're not given a class. It's, it's just like a normal function, you just happen to be putting it in the scope of that, that class. That works fine too. Uh, it means that the lock ends up being on the static method, just like a normal function. Now what if we put this on a class method? If you put it on a class method, it blows up and it doesn't work. Uh, the reason for this is that when you use bars on a class, uh, which is what we're getting past as that instance argument, it's not really returning a diff, it's returning what's called a diff property in Python 2 and a mapping proxy in Python 3. So it's not a diff, and the reason this fails is that you can't update it. It's not, you can't, uh, there's no set default uh, call on it like there is in a normal dictionary. So this is not going to work. So what extra trick are we going to have to need to do this? Uh, so we get a bit more complicated. Uh, we are going to still look up the instance of the lock on whatever it is we're doing, and in this case it's a class. So the lock doesn't exist, so we need to create it. So rather than using set default this time, we need to use an, our own lock as a means of gating that the operation of creating the lock the first time. So right down the bottom, we're going to create this, our own instance of a lock, uh, and up above, when we need to create that lock, we're going to go with our lock, which means that multiple threads coming in wanting to create the lock on the class. Uh, we'll block on that first, and only one will get through to set it. Uh, we then create the lock, and we can't use set default, we can't use um, assignment because that proxy is, uh, that mapping proxy on the div. I can't even do that. So, what we need to do is we need to use set atter, uh, and we can do it that way. We, that allows us to actually set it and end up getting set properly through the class. Now, you may be thinking, why wasn't I using set adder before? Why wasn't I just using get adder and set adder? Why was I going into the dictionary in the first place and using get and set default? The reason for that is this get adder works a little bit strangely when you talk about instances of the class. If you access an attribute of an instance of a class and it doesn't exist on the instance, but it exists on the class, it'll actually fall back and give you the one from the class. Now, that causes a little bit of a problem, problem with this, because uh, you see with the example. So let's test this. Let's uh, do this now. We apply our decorator to the class method, and it works. We look up the lock on the class, and it is present. We're not, if we check the class method, so it's not on the class method. So 
Devonian law. This is what we want. Well, if we have both an instance method and a class method, and we're going to call both of them, uh, order we call them here is going to be a, a, an interesting problem. So let's try and call this. If we call the class method first, uh, the class it has the thing has the lock on it. And when we call the instance method, the lock is on the instance method. So great, looks to work right. This is where we get back to that get adder, set adder. If we'd used get adder and set adder, the get adder, if we'd done that call for the instance method, one would have gone and given me the lock for the class. And it wouldn't be the desired result. So that's why there was that bit of trickery in there we were using get and set default originally, and then finally we used get and set adder. Uh, so there's a little bit of mucking around. So we end up, we now have a, a synchronized decorator, works on the function. If you have multiple normal functions, each gets its own lock. Uh, if we put them on the instance method, you're locking the instance. If you put it on the class method, you're locking the class. If you put it on a static method, you're locking that function again. And finally, there's that other final weird case of you can actually put the synchronized decorator on the class itself. And it means that, that it's effectively uh, allowing only one instance of the class to be created at a time. So the, the done score is the done score new done So that was good. We've achieved what we wanted in terms of uh, having something similar to uh, to Java, uh, and uh, it was a bit of mucking around, but we got there. Now Java also has another feature where it has it synchronized, and you can apply it to a block of code. Uh, so can we do this? A web statement using our same decorator. Can we repurpose it so that same name? applied as a decorator, but used as a context manager as well. Now, to be able to understand how we can do this, context managers, the way they work, a context manager is effectively a class, an instance of class. Uh, when you call in the with statement, when it enters that block, it needs to call the dumb score enter method, and when you execute, it's called the dumb score exit method. Now, luckily, the way that wrapped works, when it puts a decorator on it, it's actually wrapping it with a class. There is a class in there. Uh, so, and that is because the, 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 the wrap dot decorator, which I used to originally create that, which part of creating the mechanism for all the, the uh, mechanics of all of this when I apply it, this is effectively what it's doing under cover. What the app, or when you apply your decorator to function, really what it's doing is it's creating an instance of this <coughs> function wrapper, passing it the original function, and passing it my wrapper. So I've got a class in there. Now I need. Let's, well, if this is the first step, go back and change, update our code now. So rather than using uh, wrap decorator in, uh, let's go and rewrite it so that we're using this function wrapper. So the, down the bottom is our equivalent now for our function. Synchronize, we pass it the wrap function. We're going to create into this function wrapper, pass it the thing we're wrapping, and we're going to pass it our wrapper function. Our wrapper function, it's just as before, we just don't have at wrap decorator on it, so we don't need that now. Uh, we need our lock, so that, that synchronized lock function is going to do all that stuff of creating the lock the first time it's needed. And once we've got that lock, we can just go with synchronized lock call the original function. So that's our rewritten version. We now to make, need to make this sync thing returned by a synchronized a context manager object. So it has to have a dumb score x and dumb score x. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a final decorated class or wrap a class of our own which derives from function wrapper. And we're going to introduce that underscore enter and underscore exit. Uh, and rather than return the original function, use the original function, we're going to introduce this one. And uh, it means that when we return, go with synchronized on self, it'll end up calling these enter and exit methods, which will, in the enter, it will grab our lock, it will acquire the lock, and in the exit function, release it. Okay, so the, the, the acquire and release is separated across those two functions to correspond to the start and the block code. So I can do that, it works. Uh, lock, I can, the benefit of doing this is that you may not want to lock the whole function. There may be only a certain small section of that code which needs to be protected uh, for the data you're uh, Because it might, the rest of the function may be a huge amount of work which takes a long time. Uh, you only need it for that one little bit. So we can do that, we can combine the two now. Um, we can still have our synchronized decorator, and we can just synchronize on self. So it'll be picking up the lock from the, the instance, just like the, the other one. So we've managed to achieve both of those. 
uh, you can actually get a bit more complicated here. Uh, we can still do it on a class. So if you had uh, a class attribute you needed up to eight, and you didn't want to use a decorate on class method, you can still use with synchronized on object, and it will still work. Uh, and you can even do it nested inside of an instance method, which is also on synchronized. So in this case, what will happen is the synchronized on the instance method is locking on the instance, and then the with synchronized object inside of that is locking on the class attribute. Class, the attribute, the class. Attribute. They're looking good. Um, now, what about um, if we had back to our original problem? If, if, if people like to write these these things where they pass the lock in explicitly, what if we did want to share one lock between two normal functions? I'm running out of time here, so I'll have to go a bit faster. Um, the so we want to treat that. We don't want to use our synchronized vector. We're going to overload this function out yet again. We're going to supply the lock this time. Uh, in this case, our synchronized function, um, right down the bottom is what we have now, the, our, our modified version of the function mapper. So what we can do here is a, a lock function always has an acquire and release method. So we can see whether we've been passed the lock method. And if we are, we'll do something a bit different. In this case, we can just return a more simpler decorator and apply that. Uh, and it will just essentially have that decorator already supplied as an argument, we can go with that lock and call the original. So we can overload it that way as well. So we're now getting to do things that you uh, can't... Um, well, you can actually do this in... You still, still can actually do this in, in, in Java because the synchronized decorator, uh, when you use it on an object, you can actually uh, give it an argument to that as well. So we're just replicating the lock job. So what about using this one in a context manager? Now this is where it gets a bit more complicated again. Uh, but we can do it. We add a bit more again. Uh, in this case, we want to uh, we have our decorator, uh, which we had before, so synchronized lock wrapper. That was our simplified decorator. And this time we can get a bit more complicated. We're going to use a thing from the wrap called a callable object proxy. Uh, it's like what I, what I like to call a, a transparent object property. I can, I can wrap an instance of this around a, in, an object. So let's say a function, uh, in this case, or call. And I can still call it and, and interact with it, uh, the instance of that, that wrapper, wrapper around my object property. Uh, everything will be passed through to the original function. So if I call it, it'll just call the original function. But I can introduce this in and it allows me then to add in the enter and exit of the context manager. So the end result is that it ends up being used as the context manager to call enter exit, do the locking. Uh, otherwise, it was called as a normal function, uh, which is the case of where it was applied as a decorator. I'll probably turn it off to one at this point. Uh, it'll call through to the original decorator to apply to that function. So it gets messy. Uh, these slides are up on SlideShare, so if you want to try and nut it out, you can. Uh, I'm sure I've lost you at this point. But it does mean I can uh, do this. Uh, I can have a, a decorator for the lock argument, but ultimately use it as a context manager. Uh, now, actually, I've done a reasonable amount of time, so I'm just about out. Uh, important with all this, I've gone and explained all the mechanics of this as an example of how you can construct a or complex example of a decorator could also try to do extra funny stuff like being a context manager at the same time. It's not a normal use case. But it might uh, show you a little bit of things that can be done in this area of decorators and context manager. But you don't need to go and implement this yourself. If you think, oh, this is great and I want to use it, don't. Please don't do it. Uh, go and use Wrapped. It is in there as an example of how to uh, make one of my examples of, of implementing a decorator, a more complex decorator. So you just use wrap, you can then import it and uh, just use it in all the ways I've explained. So wrapped, um, it is this because it is arrived before uh, help you writing decorators, it has that decorator in there. Uh, the actual main original reason that wrapped was written was not actually for decorators, it was for <coughs> monkey patching. And who believes monkey patching is evil? Yes, a few. Uh, it is terribly evil. Um, and I'm one of the worst offenders at it because I used to work for a company called New Relic oh. and I wrote the agent for their application performance monitoring in Python. Uh, 
it does really, really, really horrible monkey patching <laughs> of your code. And I don't work there anymore, but um, I, it boggles me that people actually use it because it does really evil stuff. And they, people are very, very trusting because <laughs> uh, it's actually going in and modifying the code of your application and all the frameworks that uh, you're using, Django, Flask, uh, database things. It's going and applying wrappers into all of that code uh, and you're hoping it to work. Uh, the whole point of Wrapped and why I created it is that um, writing decorators, although may, may appear simple, uh, is not. There's a lot of corner cases with, with implementing them. Most people will use that very simple way of doing decorator with nested function and functal wrap s. Uh, that fails in a lot of situations. Uh, can't be applied in certain contexts with certain Python versions. It doesn't preserve introspection properly. Um, the argument signatures and all sorts of things that breaks down. And that's where if you are writing your own decorators, I really, really encourage you to use wrapped because <coughs> there's a lot of effort gone into wrapped so that you can use it and it make, does all these things correctly. It works all the, in these, all these corner cases. It preserves introspection properly. So please go and look at that more if you're, if you're doing decorators. Uh, so one final plug I did mention I was um, uh, working previously with New Relic. I actually worked for uh, uh, Red Hat now, and a lot of my time is actually not involved in doing horrible like, stuff like um, monkey patching, but actually do with uh, deploying applications in Docker, Kubernetes, and OpenShift. Uh, so if you are interested in that, uh, I've actually got a couple of books um, if you're interested in that sort of stuff. I've got some copies here. I'll give away paper copies as well. If you want PDF, you can actually go to that site and you can find links off to, to both of those. Uh, but, um, and that was sort of part of what the talk was originally going to be before I sponsored the Go there and free to do that. That is wrapped. Um, so I think we're almost out of town. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Did I lose everyone? No. <laughs> Not so much a question, but a thank you for wrapped. Because <laughs> I have shot myself in the foot before. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, um, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's neither confused or anything, but I just wanted that this is wrapped the same but general ways that we use on the approaches. We have to use it in the way that we describe it here. Now, my, what I'll explain here in the talk and see if it's clear is one example of using this. Uh, it, this is a very complicated, convoluted one. And I just thought it was an interesting problem to go through to, as a, it's like a bit of a story about what's involved in doing more complicated things. Uh, but no, if you're just doing very basic decorators, practice entirely for that. Okay? And you, you won't have to do all this nonsense I'm doing. It, it's a special case. So let's say if we want to use, in this case, try to put the wrap over the decorator, let's say take examples of class, can we still use that? Yes. Um, and that's one of the problems with, with trying to do your own um, decorators with uh, nested functions and functions wrap this. They often don't work properly when you apply them on top of other decorators. Uh, and take, for example, um, when, when you when you call an instance, um, an instance method on a class, there is a um, number of steps that it goes through. Because like when you define a method on a class, if you actually look at the class in the context of that definition, it's just like a normal function with, a, with this extra self-argument. When you actually call that through an instance, it goes through this thing called method binding, uh, which actually takes the original function, creates a new function, which is bound to that instance with the self-argument. And when you call that, it transparently passes the self argument for you. Okay. Now, in in the um, uh, let's see if I can. Quickly find. So one interesting thing about wrapped is that uh, normally if you were applying a normal decorator on an instance method. Your self-argument would come through in the arguments. And this is why it becomes a problem of being able to have one which works on both a normal function and an instance. In RAT, the self-argument is here in the instance. It's not in here. And that's why you can implement a decorator which works on both a 
normal function and instance method because the argument set's always the same in each case. If you need to distinguish the instance, then that's where you can go to the instance argument. And uh, so wrapped handles all that method binding for you. It's, it's, it's aware of all of that. And so it can work properly on normal instance methods and class methods. Uh, whereas if you try and do it yourself and, and then start applying it on uh, the top of other decorators especially, uh, that instance method binding doesn't occur and things can fall apart. And that's where you go off here. Go use trap, a wrapped because it, it does everything correctly so you don't fall into those traps. So what do I have to do? What do I have to do or avoid doing two subclasses down so that I don't accidentally break? So I can imagine I have a conflict with a different decorator, two subclasses down, and stuff stops functioning properly. Is there a way to prevent me from doing that to myself? Or do you uh, mean <clears throat> do you mean if you had created a derived class and then you had overridden instance method with your own and then we're calling into the base class one as well? Yeah. It just all works. So you're just using your um, derived class. Uh, essentially, your derived class method is going to be like a totally separate method. And when you call the base class one, you're just using super to access it and calling it. That will work fine. Nothing special involved. On catch methods as well? Yes. Okay. Um, so class method, uh, class method's a bit weird because there isn't really, there's not derivation from the instances. So it's, it's just, you're just going to call base class name dot class method name. Yeah. Uh, and that'll still work and the binding for the class argument in that case will be handled separately because it's just, it's just treated like a normal separate call. Any other questions? Oh, oh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, I, was, I, mean, I wrote the blog post about this originally two years ago, so actually if you go to my blog, which is uh, blog.dscpl.com.au, there's a, over the right hand side, a shortcut link to a series of about 10 or 12 posts on decorators, uh, and this example is explained in the, in the blog post. And I'll be wanting to, in a long time, actually do a talk on that. So that's where that's come from. Okay.